This morning, instead of for our ladies Bible class here at New Hope Road, Church of Christ, we're not going to do the normal class, the book we have been doing on Heather Pryor's book, Heart to Heart. We're going to do a different study this morning, a very needed study. One of our members said something um, to me that that I could tell was really breaking her heart. And William and I talked about it later, and I thought we need to have a study about this. I don't know, I'm, I know that he preaches on these verses all the time, but I thought for our ladies class, I really wanted to have a study about this and really specifically address this topic. And what we're gonna talk about is family and friends, family and friends who do not obey the gospel or if they have obeyed the gospel, they have fallen away and are unfaithful. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Um, all of us, all of us deal with this. We all have family or friends that are, that is the situation. So we're going to this morning go over verses. What can I do? Have I done what I can? And is their spiritual state my fault? We're going to go over um, as many verses as we can this morning, and this is not an exhaustive study of this topic. There are, I'm sure there are plenty of verses that you can still um, read in your Bible about this, and um, I know this isn't going to be everything we can say about it, but we're going to do this in our Bible class time. So, number one, first we're going to start off with the point, am I right with God? Before we can try and teach others, of course, what we know from the Bible, we need to make sure, check ourselves first and see, am I right? For an example, it would be silly for me, it would be wrong for me to say to someone else, oh, you need to come to worship. You need to come and be at worship all the time as much as you can. If I'm not doing it, they see they see that as a hypocrite. And um, I know people outside of the church throw that word around a lot, that people in the church are hypocrites. But if we are trying to win somebody, we really need to check our own selves and see, am I doing what I need to do? Am I attending as I'm able. I'm not talking about those that have issues, sick, can't drive at night, things like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a Christian who willfully will not be at worship when they know they should. That's what I mean. If we're guilty of something that, and that's just an example, something like that, how are we going to be able to teach someone else the Bible? And, and get them to understand it's important for us to be together as brothers and sisters, as coming to learn more about the Bible. So um, we need to just check ourselves and see, am I right with God? Am I right with God in my example? Am I right with God in the deeds that I do? Am I right with God in the service that I am doing as a Christian, because we all know that being a, a Christian is a servant. Okay, let's start off with 1 Corinthians. Whoever wants to start reading 1 Corinthians, we're going to read chapter 9 and verse 27. Okay. Okay. First Corinthians nine twenty seven. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Okay, so here's the scripture where Paul is speaking that he himself needs to be careful. And he's an apostle. And that does not mean I do not say that as he's way above the rest of us, but even an apostle who, um, who saw Jesus or had Jesus speak to them, even they are human like we are, and they need to be watchful of their, of their selves, of their um, deeds and their example and things like that. So that's Paul to the church in Corinth speaking there. 
Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This will be Paul again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Does not behave rudely, does not Okay, sin. hold on. Oh. Check that. Check, check the verse. Oh. 2 Corinthians 13. Five. I think you're in 1 Corinthians. 2 yeah, Corinthians chapter 13, oh. verse 5. Oh. Yeah, that's so... That's yeah, easy to do. First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. Mm -hmm. I better turn it back. Just give it to me. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here again, Paul is encouraging Christians to examine yourselves. We, we all need to, like we've already said, we need to check ourselves, make sure we're doing what we need to do in God's will. We have our Bible to learn from. We have each other, which we talk about a lot. We have each other as a family for a reason, and we need to always lean on each other. Examine yourselves, whether you are in the face. Test yourselves, okay? So we need to make sure that we are right with God. And let's go to Hosea chapter 4. Very familiar verse, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Thank you. Okay, very simple, very simple here in the book of, of Hosea. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If we do not know our Bibles, <clears throat> we will not be able to teach others. And there's so much to teach. <laughs> this is such an important book. This has to do with our life here and our life beyond. And if we do not know our Bible, we cannot help teach others. Now, there is, <clears throat> there are Christians who become Christians later in life. Perhaps they were not reared in the church. All happens all the time. We have sisters here. They become Christians later in life. Or perhaps it's someone who was a Christian early in life and they fall away. They, they become unfaithful. Now, both of those are forgiven at their repentance. They're both forgiven at their repentance. Whether you heard about the Bible, you obey later in life, when you obey at your repentance and you do those steps, then you have forgiveness. Or someone who was a Christian, they fell away, but they repented. Now, both of those cases, either one of those, there's going to be challenges to reach family and friends because they'll see you, they would see that person as, well, you didn't used to be like that. It's a, it's a new life. Being a Christian is a new life. You are a new creature, as the scriptures tell us. So sometimes it's a challenge to reach others when they see you as a different person, perhaps. Even someone that, that was a Christian, they fell away. Maybe they're doing things and they're having an influence to others that they shouldn't have had. And then when they repent, and of course God forgives them at their repentance when they've repented properly, then they may have a challenge of reaching those people again, okay? But either way, either way, they can and they must teach other people. So um, that, I mean, that's just, I wanted to make sure that we covered all of that. And that was actually a point William brought up with me also is go over <laughs> all of the possibilities. So... Number one, we want to know that we are right with God. Now, we're going to go into our second point. So, this is over the topic we're going over today, family and friends who do not obey or have fallen away. Please, if you have a comment, 
let's grab the microphone, we'll get it to you, not a big deal, and please let us know what you want to say. Second point is, have we taught those outside of Christ or have we warned those who have fallen away? And that is something that we are to do as Christians. Um, when, we come a, when we come across that, we know family, we know friends that, that have never obeyed. We do have a responsibility. We are not to keep Christianity to ourselves. It is not to be a selfish thing. We are to spread the good news. We are to share the Bible with others. So actually, I'm going to, this is a long reading. I'm going to read this one, not to mess up the lady who's ready to read. But this reading in Ezekiel, we're going to go Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're going to, I'm, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. This is a very, very, very important set of scriptures we need to remember. Ezekiel 33, starting in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make them their watchmen, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Now that is a set of verses, Old Testament, Ezekiel the prophet, but that applies to us. It does not apply to just Ezekiel speaking to Judah. These are verses that we need to take very seriously. If there is someone that we have the opportunity or make an opportunity to warn them, it says right here very, cl very clearly, if you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Sin is another word for iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. If there was someone that you could have spoken to that you knew needed to know the plan of salvation, needed to know the Bible, and you never said anything to them, then that's going to be on us. That will be on you, me, okay? And then verse 9 again, But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn, he shall die in his iniquity, die in his sins, but you have delivered your soul. Okay? Those are very important verses that we need to remember. I know that was a long reading, but I think it's very important. Let's also go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, our next reader, and let's read verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that though through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Okay, thank you. And we, we have you, I think we used this first last class because it's a, very, it's a very important verse that applies to a lot of things. Some people believe 
the Old Testament is, is done and those verses don't apply to us. But here's a verse in Romans, Paul teaching us, those things that were written before in the scriptures are written for our learning. So that's why I wanted to bring that out. The verses in Ezekiel are verses we need to understand and to take very seriously. Okay, let's go on to, here's another verse we all know, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, this is a verse we all are so familiar with. All scripture, all scripture. It doesn't say the gospel. It doesn't say the New Testament only or what the apostles um, might have said in their time. It's all scripture, which includes the Old Testament. All of the Bible, all of scripture is for us to learn from, to teach from, to correct from. Any comments so far? Because I don't want to talk too much and not give you ladies a chance to say something. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Again, very, very familiar. Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to read verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. Thank you. Now, of course, we understand this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is what is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. And there are those who think, well, that's who he said it to. He said it to those 11. And those were the ones who were supposed to go do that. It's to all of us. That, that set of verses, that teaching is to all of us. We all are to go and to teach what the Bible tells us to teach about salvation. Because if we keep it to ourselves, Others are lost, and that is, that's a thought we can't even comprehend, <laughs> being lost. And you don't want your family, you don't want your friends lost. You want to do everything you can, everything that makes sure that you've done everything you can before it's too late. And we all know we are not guaranteed any time. We have... In my life, I have seen children before the age of 10 pass away. I have seen a wonderful young man at 18 pass away who was going, who was planning on being a preacher. <laughs> We've, and then many people have long lives and that's wonderful too, but we are not guaranteed the next minute. So we all need to do everything we can, okay? And why? Because a soul's destination is at, at, at stake. The soul's destination is at stake. And it's not just about, here's a good book. Maybe you'll enjoy reading it. Maybe we can talk about some things. It's so much more important than that. And we need to do our best to get others to understand. And I completely understand, ladies. Not everybody will understand but let's make sure we've done what we can to, to, that we've done our best, okay? So, there is a soul's destination at stake. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, thank you. Very Again, another verse we hear, we know, we know what it says, we understand that. All have sinned. 
Okay, there's a soul, there is a soul at stake because all have sinned. We sin, we take ourselves away from God, and if you are not in Christ, then there is no forgiveness of those sins. And those sins will lead you to damnation, an eternal damnation, which is another, another um, thought, concept, people truly do not understand, do not comprehend eternal damnation. Again, in Romans, let's read Romans chapter 6 this time and verse 23 again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, thank you. So, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That is, that is spiritual death. Sin will have you die spiritually if you do not have the forgiveness of those sins, and that's eternal damnation. So, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus, and that's what we want, and that's what we need to do our very best to teach others. Okay, we want that eternal life. Okay, so let's just go over a couple of questions. Have we taught, and we, taught, we said this just a little bit, have we taught that the Bible, this Bible, is God's Word? It's not just another book on our shelf. It's not just a book we should casually read and think, oh, I guess there, there's some good things in there that I can apply to. This book is God's word, and we need to, as lovingly and seriously as we can, convey that to others. Okay, let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. And let's read verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay, thank you. There is so much in these two verses. <laughs> this Bible is living and powerful, God's Word, living and powerful. It will help us know what we need to do to have a home in heaven, and we can teach that to others. And verse 13 is telling us there is nothing hidden from God. There's nothing hidden from God. There's nothing we can do that he will not know about. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him, that's capital H, him meaning God or Jesus, to whom we must give account. And we talked about that a lot in last month's Bible class, that we will be giving account of our lives. So, this Bible, this book we have, we're so very privileged to have. And let's not forget that either, ladies. Not everybody always had this Bible so easily given and, and um, available that we can read it and we can buy copies of it so easily. There have been times in history where People maybe did not know how to read, or they were kept from being able to read the Bible. But we are very, very blessed that we have the scriptures, and there are plenty of classes or um, other books and commentaries that you can study to know that this Bible is from God, and it's not just another book. This Bible will tell you that yourselves, but if you're looking for um, things that have happened in history of how we receive the Bible, there are classes on that and books on that. So there's no doubt. So someone can't come to you and say, well, how do you know this is from God? There are classes on that also, if they don't want to just take the scriptures of how we got the Bible. 
So um, let's make sure that they understand that the Bible is God's word. Let's also go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 and read verse 19, please. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay. All right. Now, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he is letting them know that it has been established things that they are being taught. The kingdom is the church here. We understand, we as Christians understand that the kingdom is the church. It has been established in heaven. What is to be bound, what we are to do and what we are not to do. Okay. And the Bible teaches us that. And the Bible again is God's word. So have we taught that the Bible is God's word? Have we conveyed God's love by sending Jesus? Have we conveyed that to people? You know, people will see paintings of the crucifixion or paintings of Jesus in a manger as so commonly is seen at, at Christmas time, the end of the year. But we, we need to, as best as we can, lovingly get them to understand He's not a character in a story. Jesus absolutely is God, part of God. He is our Savior. He came to die for us. And we need to understand, we need to have others understand that God had so much love for our souls and that we will have a home with him that he sent Jesus. Let's look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, and please read verses 13 through 18. He has delivered us up from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. All right, thank you. Okay, these verses are teaching us so many things. God gave us Jesus, that is the son of his love. Through Jesus, through his blood, we have redemption. We have forgiveness of sins because he died on the cross for us. That's the only way we're going to have salvation is through Jesus's blood. And it is saying, it is also teaching us he is part of God. All things were created by him. So the creation week, Jesus, the son, God, the son is who created those things. So he always has had a part in the Godhead, of course, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, all things were created through him and for him. And then it teaches us that he is above all things. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the church. And there's another man's doctrine that, doctrine that we're going to have to get someone to understand. Jesus is the head of the church, not the Pope not some man or woman who comes up with something that they think fits their life and they teach it to others. If it's not from this Bible, that is not what God wants of us. We need to only go through the Bible. Jesus is the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. So those are things that we need to teach 
that God's love is so much that he sent Jesus for us. Okay, let's go to John 3, 16. Again, John 3, 16 and 17, verses we read so very often. Let's read 16 and 17, please. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist. Okay, hold, be... hold on, please. John, ch John chapter 3, verses 16. Oh, oh it's okay. No, nope. James. No, I'm sorry. That's my scribbling. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I say James? James I am so sorry. My fault. That is absolutely my fault. Okay, so we'll, I am sorry. What is that? John, John 3, 16 and 17. See, I need you ladies to watch me. I wrote the wrong thing on the board. That is me. It is. It does say James. That's my fault. <laughs> that is absolutely my fault. I apologize. John 3, 16 and 17. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be <coughs> saved through him. Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Now, some people can, some people maybe not even so familiar with the church or the Bible, some people can somewhat quote verse 16, that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. But these verses are so very important. God gave Jesus to be our Savior. Whoever, and it is so clearly laid out, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So logically, if you do not believe in him, you will not have everlasting life. That's logic. And then verse 17 is forgotten a lot of the times. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. People are condemned through their own actions of not believing. Jesus came to save us. So let's not forget that either. Okay, so let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay. Now, this is Paul speaking to the church in Galatia that he's crucified with Christ. He did those steps to come into contact with the blood of Christ. He was... Not that he was literally crucified on a cross like Jesus was, but it is he did those things. He did those steps that we are taught to do in God's scriptures, in God's word, to come in contact with Christ. And it's Christ that lives in him. If we are not in Christ, and so many scriptures talk about being in Christ, if we're not in Christ, then we have not we are not a part of the kingdom, the church, and we have not done the things that we need to, that we will have that hope we talk about so often and have a home in heaven, okay? And it's talking about faith, and we're going to talk about that, one of those, those steps in just a little bit, okay? God, he is the son of God. He loves me, and he gave himself for me. Jesus came down as a man, as a human, and he died on the cross and went through all of that suffering for me. And it needs to be personal, not just for others. It was for me. My sins put him on the cross. And that is something that we need to convey to others also. All right. Let's also go to Ephesians chapter 1. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. All right. Thank you. That was Ephesians 1, 7. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 
chapter 1, verse 7. Okay. In him, in Christ, we have redemption. Okay. We have forgiveness of sins. All right. Through his blood. There again, it talks about his blood. He shed his blood for a reason. And the more we know our Bible, the more we understand our Bible, we know that Jesus was a sacrifice just as God's people in the Old Testament in, in the times before Jesus came to the earth, they had under Mosaic law, they had a sacrifice they had to make and blood had to be shed. Jesus was the sacrifice for sins for all mankind and he shed his blood so that we can have forgiveness. Now, let's go ahead and just go over. I know you ladies here know the steps of salvation. We're going to go over the steps of salvation and maybe those that might be listening to this video or you share this video with, this is something that someone outside of Christ or someone that has fallen away should know and understand. Now, please, if I've written something wrong on the board again, or I say something wrong, don't hesitate to correct me because we want the right information going out. You're not gonna embarrass me. I want the right information going out and I do apologize for having the wrong book up there earlier. Okay, we're gonna go over the steps of salvation. First step tends to be that we hear, we have to hear the word. Let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, thank you so much. So faith, we have faith, we have to hear the word of God. So hearing the word, we hear it to understand it and to start to believe. We have to hear it first. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's go to John, <clears throat> excuse me, John chapter 12. And verse 48, he who re rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Thank you. Okay. Jesus speaking, laid out so simply, he who rejects me, meaning Jesus, does not receive my words, meaning Jesus, has that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And these words also, the words Jesus spoke are in these scriptures, in this very important book, not just another book on your shelf, a very important book. They will judge that soul in the last day. So we must hear those words. We must hear those words. Now, after we hear, we start to hear, we need to believe. We need to believe the words. Let's go to, let's go to Mark 16 and verses, and we've read some of this already. Let's read verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned. Thank you, all right. Again, so logically laid out, so logically laid out, when you believe, you need to hear the word, you need to believe the word, believe and be baptized. If you do not believe, you will be condemned. That's what the end of that, of verse 16 is saying. He who does not believe will be condemned. And it logically follows, he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. Okay? It all fits together. Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. All right, all right, thank you. All right, so there again, it's, it's stressing to us, Jesus is teaching us how important it is that you believe. And what is it we are to believe? 
We are to believe in Jesus. We are to believe Jesus is God's son. We are to believe that he came to this earth to be our savior. So all of that fits together. And where do we learn this? We learn this in the Bible. That's why we need to know our Bible and know to teach it to others. Okay, let's go to, let's go to, um, where are we? Acts 8. Acts 837. Um, my Bible skips at 36 and then 38. <laughs> okay. Shall I read? Okay. 36? And it and skips they verse. Were going along the road. It skips verse 37? 37. Okay. And okay, well then. Probably 38 is supposed to. It's 36, 38, 39. I have the ESV. I've never okay. had that happen before. Okay, all right, well, let, let me just, let me read 837. Okay. Okay. Then Philip said, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay. Verse 38 is, so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And so here is one of the many um, lessons in the book of Acts that is teaching us of how someone hears the gospel, reads the gospel, believes the gospel, and they are ready to be baptized, okay? So this is Philip coming across the Ethiopian eunuch and he asks him, what's hindering me to be baptized, okay? Verse 37, I wanted to, to bring out because it specifically says, if you believe with all of your heart, we need to believe. We need to truly be convicted in our heart and believe that, okay? And let's also go to Hebrews. Hebrews, another verse we're very familiar with, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. All right. Okay. So here again, we have to have faith. We have to believe he who comes to God must believe that he, capital H, meaning Godhead, that he is. And he, capital H, is a rewarder of those who diligently Seek Him, capital H. And that's something else to teach people. The pronouns in the Bible, a lot is capital H, meaning it's they're talking about the Godhead, okay? We have to believe in God. We have to believe in Jesus, that, that we believe what the scriptures tell us and that we will be worthy of that reward in the end. And we have to diligently seek. That was a word I got tripped up on last class, diligently. We need to diligently study our Bibles, do service that we are asked to do in the scriptures. We need to be diligent about all of that. Okay, here, believe. Let's go to the next step, repent. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 13, and we need someone to please read verse 3 and verse 5. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. It said, Jesus says this twice, okay? Sim again, simple logic. He says it very plainly. No, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repent is a change of your heart. Repentance is a change of your life. It's not just saying something casually. You have to absolutely have the purpose in your heart to change the way that you have been living and you are ready to live for God and do God's 
will. He says that in verse 3 and again in verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So repent is one of the very important steps that we need, we must do. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and please read verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, thank you. Okay, this is the day of Pentecost. Peter, not just Peter, Peter is who is quoted here, but the apostles were preaching to people in different languages that they needed to hear that language to understand. Peter is the account that we are given in Acts chapter 2. And Peter tells them when they have asked, what shall we do? Because they have heard the word. So Peter doesn't start off saying, well, hear, believe. They've already heard the word. They are believing that there, there is something they have to do. They're believing in God. They, well, they had some belief in God, but they are now understanding where they are wrong. And they, are, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And now Peter says, repent, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay, so repent is so very, very important. A change of your heart, a change of your life. You will not be going down that same life that you had before. Let's go to, we're still in the book of Acts. Acts, Acts 8, chapter 8, and verse 37. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, we read that, didn't we? Right. Okay, sorry about that. We read that one. All right, that was more on believe. <clears throat> okay, let's go on to um, chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, and please read verses 30 and 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, so Paul teaching that God overlooked things before, but now commands all men, all men everywhere, not Jew only, all men, Jew, Gentile. Gentile in the New Testament refers to anyone who is not Jew. Okay, we all, and this again applies to us, all men everywhere are to repent. And then verse 31 teaches us why. There is a day he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That man being Jesus, he has given us, he has, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead, him capital H, meaning Jesus, Jesus being raised from the dead. So we are to repent because we will be judged. So hear, believe, repent. Let's go on to confess. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. All right, thank you. So the next step here, believe, repent, confess. We are, the scripture right here is teaching us, we are to be willing to confess Jesus before men. We are to confess that we believe Jesus is the Son of God and he is going to be our Savior. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. And please read verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, 
and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thank you. All right. Another very needed verse to understand that we are to confess the Lord Jesus. And again, confess and believe are being linked together. There are verses that link repentance and baptism. There are verses here that, that link confession and belief or faith. Okay. So it all, it all goes together. All right. So we, <clears throat> excuse me, we are to confess. We are. And then verse 10 is confession with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Okay. Here, believe, repent, confess. Then we are to be baptized. Okay. We have already read Mark 16, 16. We read that. All right, let's go on to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. <clears throat> then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay. Thank you. That's Acts 2, 41. Thank you. So, those who gladly received his word, they heard, they believed, they repented, they confessed, they were baptized. They're added to the church. Okay? They are to be baptized. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. One of the accounts... Acts chapter 9 and verse 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Okay, and this is talking about Paul, actually Saul. This is talking about Saul of Tarsus when Ananias came to him and taught him the things that, that Saul <laughs> needed to understand that Saul needed to understand he had been persecuting the Lord's church and he thought he was doing what was right. And that's something for us to remember, ladies. There, we're going to have family and friends that may follow a man's doctrine and they can truly think in their heart, believe in their heart that they're doing what's right. But if they are not following the scriptures as the scriptures are reading, I'm sorry, as the scriptures are written for us and that this is what we need to follow, not a doctrine someone else came up with, then they're not doing what is right. We have to absolutely stay with the Bible. But we all know we have family and friends who truly believe they're doing what was right. Saul thought he was doing what was right, but, Anna, but Jesus met him on the road to Damascus Ananias was sent to him to teach him. And then when Paul understood what it was he needed to do, he was baptized. And Paul becomes one of the apostles. Instead of persecuting the church, he's an apostle in the church. Let's also go to Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. <coughs> And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay, another place where they're commanded to be baptized in Jesus' name. So it always, there's so many places in Acts. Someone is, here's the gospel, they do those steps, whether it is written out word for word or not, we can understand by putting the scriptures together they hear, they believe, they repent of their sins, they're ready to live a new life, they confess Jesus is Lord, and they are baptized. And baptism in the original Greek, which the New Testament was written in, baptism is to dip, to plunge, to immerse. The scriptures tell us they go down into the water. They don't have water sprinkled on them. These are adults that are being baptized. They are not infants. That's another doctrine men came up with. If we follow the Bible and read our Bibles and lovingly help others understand, 
that the Bible is God's word and they need to read what the Bible says, then they will understand what baptism is, okay? So there are five steps, but we're not done because we are to live faithful. Once you're baptized, that's not your ticket. You don't just punch your ticket and say, well, okay, I was baptized, I'm going to heaven. We are to live faithfully. Let's go over some of those scriptures as well. Um, I skipped, I'm sorry, I had to turn the page. I skipped a couple of verses. All right, let's go to Romans chapter six. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Thank you. We don't want to skip that verse. <laughs> That's a very important verse. Okay? We're baptized into Jesus, we're baptized into his death. It is a burial. And we have heard preachers say this, you don't bury something by sprinkling a little dirt on it. If something is to be buried, it goes down into the ground. When we are baptized, we go down into the water, that we are covered in the water. And that is how you are baptized. That is what that Greek word baptizo means. Okay, and let's go to Galatians 3.27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, thank you. Another verse just confirming all of that. Now, now we're going to go over that last verse that we, that I skipped those couple of verses by mistake. We are to live faithfully. Once we have done these steps and we are a Christian and we are in Christ, then we live faithfully, okay? Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, but I would actually, it's the end of that verse that I'm getting at. It's, I'm saying verse, verse 10, but I actually want you to start with be faithful. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Thank you. Okay. I know there's more in that, in that verse where Jesus is specifically speaking to the churches, but it was the last part of Revelation 2.10 I wanted to focus on. Be faithful unto death. Jesus is telling that Christian church, those souls, those Christians, be faithful. You're going to have some hard things coming up. You're going to be suffering. Be faithful unto death, and you will receive your crown of life. So it's not a one-time thing. Once we are baptized, we are to live our life faithfully. However long that life may be, we are to live faithfully. Let's also go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Thank you. Last class, we talked a lot about the book of life. There's a book you want your name in. He will not, if you do what he says, if you obey Jesus, if you're being the Christian he needs you to be, he will not blot out your name from the book of life, and he will confess your name before his Father, okay? You do not want your name taken out of the book of life. Your name needs to be there, and we need to lovingly teach others. Their name needs to book, be in the book of life. All right, so um, um, let's go to Luke 15 and verse 10. Luke Likewise, I'm sorry, Luke 15, verse 10. Go ahead. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay. All right. So that's how important this is. That's how important this is to God. There's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. That's a soul that won't have eternal dam damnation. That is a soul that will have eternal life when they repent. Okay, and talking about eternal, 
have we taught the judgment to come? And this is where things get scary. <laughs> and this is where people, <clears throat> again, we need to at our very best, once people understand that this book is teaching the truth, it teaches the truth that we, there is an eternal outcome. We are not on this earth for the time we're here, whether it's 10 years or almost 100 years, we're not on this earth and then it's all done. Our soul goes, will be transformed, transferred to another place, okay? And, and there will be an eternal outcome that one will want to be in and one will not want to be in, okay? Have we taught them the judgment to come? Let's go over Romans, Romans chapter 14, and let's read verses 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to me. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Okay, each of us will give an account, all right? And we will be before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> Somebody's phone is ringing, I think. Okay, <clears throat> okay. So um, anyway, so we will, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. All right. So, uh, Romans, okay, we're on Romans 14. The 10 through 12 is teaching us we will be at the judgment seat. Christ will be the judge. We will be, we will give an account of the things we have done in this life. If you live righteously, that's one destination. If you are unrighteous, that is a Another destination that we do not want to be in. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay, thank you. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord, he is the righteous judge, and he is going to judge righteously. If you've done right, you will have a home in heaven. If you have followed the Bible, if you have not followed the Bible or never obeyed the Bible, you will not be in heaven. You will be in hell. And the Bible clearly teaches that. And it teaches that there will be a judgment day. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and let's read verses 26 through 31, please. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy as who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right. Here in Hebrews, the writer is, is telling us, trying to get us to understand, if we are not remaining in God's word, 
you will be, you are trampling the Son of God underfoot. You have counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Those are very serious charges against someone. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we need to make sure we, as we said to, at the beginning of class, that we are doing what we need to do, but as best as we can, convey the seriousness of this to others. Okay, and one more verse here, Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so every one of us, every one of us, knee should bow. We should bow. We will, at that judgment day, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the ones who did right have one destination the ones who did not follow god did not stay with god have another destination okay now the third point is and these verses are not on the board i ran out of <laughs> out of board so um these verses are not on the board we do not need to feel guilty if we have done all that we can and that's what this sister was heartbroken about she was sitting there one day and she just was tearing up saying her her family members of her family she knew that they weren't right with god and it was on her heart and that that goes to all of us and she was feeling guilty about it but that was the point of this class if we have done all that we can if we have taught them lovingly, if we have said all that we can to those people and tried to get them to believe the Bible, to follow the Bible, to live the Bible, and they, whatever their choice is, we can't feel guilty about that. There's nothing else we can do. We cannot make somebody obey. Everyone has free will. Everyone has free will and it's up to them to obey. As we've read, each will give account. I can't give a, an account for my own children or for my husband, William. I only give an account for me. But I need to do my best to teach those around me and to help those who maybe have fallen away. But once I've done that, I can't feel guilty about it. Okay, now I want to read Proverbs, and I know we're going a little long, but I really think this is important. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 20 through 33. Proverbs 1, 20 through 33, since I don't have it on the board. Wisdom calls, out, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you, because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded, because you disdain all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm, at your destruction comes like a whirlwind. When, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them 
and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Okay, there is a set of verses in Proverbs, which is such a beautiful book to read over and over again that is telling all of us when people are given knowledge, they are told God's word and they don't obey, it is on them. And we who do obey, that's good. And that's where we need to stay, okay? Now, Paul, in speaking to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, Paul, and we, we, won't, we won't read that one, but we know that Paul was speaking to King Agrippa and he wanted King Agrippa to understand what was um, required of him. And King Agrippa, after he listens to Paul, he says, almost thou persuades me to be a Christian. Almost. And it's never written for us that he did, that he did become a Christian. Almost is not there, right? We understand that. Um, let's last go to Matthew chapter 10. Last verse, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 14. Whoever wants to read next. Okay, Matthew 10, 14. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Okay. And this is Jesus giving instructions to his disciples. But there again, ladies, this can come to us. We can understand that. If someone does not hear God's words and they're not going to obey or they're not going to return if they have fallen away, we could use that also. Jesus is telling his disciples here, if they don't receive your words, shake off the dust from your feet. That means go on. There are other people maybe you can reach. And that's something we need to understand. We do all we can to work on one soul, on one heart, a family member, a friend. If they won't obey, we continue to pray for them and we continue to be a good example, but we can't make them obey and we can't feel guilty about it. Okay? So we have to kind of just give up on them? No. I'm not saying give up on them. I just said we need to continue to be an example and continue to talk lovingly to them as we have the opportunity. But the point of this is once we've done all we can, we can't feel guilty about it. This sister was feeling guilty about things. And I want to make sure we all understand when we've done what we can, we can't feel guilty about it. We've done what we can. Let's make sure we've done what we can but the guilt is not on us. It is on that hearer for their heart to obey. It's just so painful when then they don't ever want to come see you again. They don't ever want to visit with you again. Okay. It's very painful. I understand so that. It is. It is I painful. Say, do, we, do we just quit? Okay. It, it just, it, it's hard. All right. It is. It's very hard. I completely, I completely, completely agree with you. It is hard. But being a Christian in this life is hard. We know that there will be people that don't want to associate with us because we are Christians. We don't want to hear the dirty jokes. We don't want to go to the bar. <laughs> we don't watch certain TV programs and think they're so funny and wonderful because we are Christians and others will disdain us for that. But ladies, let's remember, we have, an, we have a reward that we're, that we're heading to <laughs> and I'm not going to get upset, but that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Is there anyone else who wants to make a comment? Why? <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> yeah, we're taking care of the wait, wait. We got to have a got to have the microphone. Okay, you think in terms of the fact that God has put everything into into motion that He wants done and how we're supposed to do it, and you as an individual will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, yes, it's, it's painful, you know, when we have our relatives, you know, who, who fail to obey and we see them, you know, like going downhill. But at, at any rate, you know, 
you're going to stand individually. Right. You're not going to stand for your child. Your child's not going to stand for you. So you have to kind of keep in mind the fact that they will stand before a just God who will deal with them as, you know, justice dictates. But okay. feeling, you know, the pain of it, yes. And you as, as a Christian, you know, you, you, you hang on to God's word, the promises that he has made. You know, that if you remain faithful unto death, then you'll receive that crown of life. You know, that's not going to, you know, keep you from hurting. But, you know, you think about what you have, you know, coming. And you maybe pull back for a while, and you might see something that, that uh, you know, something might, somebody might have said or something might have been done in the process of living that might make that person change their mind. But you don't give up on them until they are, you know, are no longer here. But that doesn't mean that you go forth and you, you know, you, you just nag at them all the time. It's kind of like step back and see, you know, what life holds for us. And then when you have that opportunity, go in and pray, you know, and keep praying, you know, that God will, will help you to be more faithful and that will help, help you to, to continue this journey from earth unto heaven. Okay, and one of the ladies back there had a comment. I guess I feel like with guilt, when you when you carry that guilt, I feel like that's your the devil's going to get in there and get you, because God doesn't want you carrying that around. He doesn't want you carrying that weight on yourself. Those that, those family members, they know as like I was away from the church. I knew I knew where I needed to be. They know where they need to be. They know it. And you don't give up on them. You stay a constant in their lives as much as you can. And you keep praying for them. And when you see them, you know, I'd love for you to come to church with me. You know, if you want to come to church with me, just call me by them occasionally. And one day it may click. And one day it may not. But that guilt that you carry is, is not good. It's not good for your soul. It's not good for your heart. It's not good for your mind. It's not good for you. <coughs> right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Those are very good, needed comments. And you're right, that guilt can is, is a way of Satan pulling us down, and we can't do that. We can't do that. All right, ladies, I know that this was a bit of a long class today, and off our normal book, but I really hope this has been helpful. And if you know someone that is able to watch the, a video, watch this video, please share it with them. Um, not that I am a great speaker. This is, we have been going over verses in the Bible. It is the Bible speaking. I'm just the one up here doing a little bit of, of guiding along, but please share this video. And let's get the word out there and, and make sure that this needed topic is understood correctly.